Hello, action takers. This is the Live Blissed Out podcast, and I'm your host, Marissa Houston, helping achieve bliss through awareness and action. Thanks for joining me. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only, and any reliance on the information provided in this podcast is done at your own risk. This podcast should not be considered professional advice. Here's our listener spotlight. Carol in Madrid, Spain says that eating 12 grapes at midnight on New Year's Eve is both a tradition and a superstition. Spaniards will rarely skip eating one grape for each stroke of midnight. Muchísimas gracias for sharing this, Carol. Keep listening for more amazing traditions around the world. As we wrap up our holiday series and celebrate Christmas Eve, I hope you enjoy learning about the various ways that we celebrate this special season around the world. This episode will remind us that even though our traditions may be unique, we share a lot in common, such as generosity, kindness, hope, and love. Wishing you all a very Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays, and looking forward to 52 weeks of interviews and sharing my guest knowledge with you in the new year. This is episode 16. Our topic is holiday traditions throughout the world, and my guest is Jessica Oma. Jessica is owner of Scribe Syndicate. Scribe Syndicate is a full-service digital copywriting provider specializing in digital strategy and brand growth with a focus on small business owners and entrepreneurs interested in increasing visibility online in order to grow and expand their business. She also collaborates with web design and marketing partners and runs a business writer's workshop on Meetup to help business owners find out what their writing needs are and obtain tips and advice. To read her full blog and for more information about her services, visit her website at scribesyndicate.com. Hi, Jessica. It's really great to have you on the show today. Hi, Marissa. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited about it. Me too, especially given that the topic that we're going to be talking about is so appropriate for this Christmas Eve because we're going to be talking about celebrating the holidays throughout the world. Yeah, I think it was a great idea. Everyone comes from a mixed pot from around the world. So we all take for granted that some of the things that we celebrate at home are celebrated by other people. Once you start really looking into it, there's a lot of similarities, but people do a lot of really unique things in different parts of the world and then bring that into their families and keep that tradition going on. So it's really interesting when you look into all the details of it. Yes, it's really neat, isn't it? And I would love to learn more about how you celebrate Christmas with your family. First of all, I was born in Canada, and so my father's father was directly from the the Polish-German border area of Poland. And on my mother's side, she grew up in an English household, and my grandmother was directly from England. So I didn't realize that although those traditions for the holidays were similar between those countries, I didn't know that certain aspects of them came from one area or another. As I was growing up, we had definitely had a an English spin on things when we started out with Christmas Eve dinner with Yorkshire puddings, which a lot of people don't know what they are. It's a, you know, a meat and uh, a pastry with a gravy. And, you know, as things got more complicated, my mother backed off and <laughs> changed <laughs> that into a blank steak with Brunei sauce. And we had potatoes and broccoli for dinner with a French onion soup. And the English thing that continued during the meals was the trifle, but that's like a very complicated dessert that you have to layer with pudding and jello and fruit and lady fingers. So eventually that got to be too much for her and no one else wanted to do it. So I do a rum cake now. But one of the best things that my parents did when we were young was the stockings at the end of our bed. We would hang up our stockings on the mantle or, or on a staircase, depending on where we were living. And in the morning, they would be filled but put at the ends of our bed. And then we were instructed to take our stockings and go to our parents' bedroom and sit on their bed for coffee, hot chocolate, cookies. And that was all designed so that my parents could stay in bed longer. <laughs> but you <Pretty> smart, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. But we loved the closeness of that, sitting in their room on their bed 
we're all in our pajamas. It was really cozy. And we're talking and we're laughing and we're opening each individual gift. And that became more important to us than the trip out to the living room to open up the bigger gifts that were under the Christmas tree. Yeah, sometimes it's the little traditions that have the most lasting memories. They are. And that's exactly why I continued that same tradition with my own children. And they had the same reaction to it. So I'm so glad that I did because it's funny when you find out why it was done originally wasn't necessarily an English tradition, but the way my mother altered it to be stockings at the end of the bed, the original purpose wasn't the outcome. I mean, it ended up being just such a really close, fun time, all built around just trying to make the morning easier. Yeah. <laughs> so, and the other thing, too, that I carried on from my mother was a felt advent tree that she told me later she bought it at a craft store. And uh, she put the little pieces together. It was like little felt ornaments with decorations that you could glue on them. And then they had Velcro and you stuck them to the tree each day until Christmas, starting December 1st to, through the 24th. And I never realized that that's all that was, but it started to get kind of grungy looking when I took it over for my kids. And so I turned it into a template, and made a brand new one and started that with my children. And they did the same thing that me and my sisters did. We would fight over whose turn it was to put the one in the tree. And it was such a simple thing, but you know, we loved it that much. It was that important to us. Yeah. It just reminded me too when my kids were growing up how hard it is to wait those twenty four days. It seems like forever. Oh, when you're waiting for something, it always seems longer than it really is. And I find that those advent calendars are now very popular. I mean, your tradition was a little different, but there are now advent calendars and I didn't even know what those were. I'd never heard of them before. And now I see them everywhere. Everybody's talking about making an advent calendar or buying one or going through the tradition. So you're right. It's the little things that you do throughout the month leading towards Christmas Eve and Christmas Day that are really memorable. And I would think that it's maybe because you're doing it every single day until you get to the big day. So there's this tradition, like this month-long tradition that you do. And of course, as you're going to be talking about in some cultures, they plan months in advance and do things <laughs> way before we even do it here in the United States. Right, like the yes, Philippines. that's right. They actually start as early as September and keep going on through, I think, February, was it? So... Yeah. Usually like till the Three Kings marks the official end of the season. But I think like anything else, when I was growing up, I remember it started maybe in October, but now it seems like September. They're, they're already planning for it and getting things out. And it just seems to be getting longer and longer. Pretty soon it'll be six months of the year. <laughs> we'll be celebrating <laughs> the holidays. Yeah. And I think that talking to you about all this is really fun because you are a copyright and a copywriter is, is somebody who puts information together for people. And I thought what an appropriate way to showcase what you do and how you do it through the holiday message, which is the holidays that are being celebrated throughout the world. And you were able to come up with this blog that you put on your website that people can look at so that they can get a sense of what you do. But could you talk to us about exactly what a copywriter is and why somebody needs one? Sure. A copywriter can do a lot of different things. Generally, they're putting together written material, either in print or online. And most of the time, it's angled towards businesses and their needs. So many businesses don't have the time or the energy or the talent to put all their written material together. And this, this could be advertisements or it could be website material like the home service and about pages. It can be blog articles, all of those things. And it takes time to put that together. So when a business gets to a certain point where they can't handle that themselves or in-house, then they look for someone who can do it for them. And my business really focuses on the digital content needs. Not that I can't provide material for print needs, but most of the people that come to me are looking at updating a website. They have a business, they've been working on it for a couple of years, and now they're ready to upgrade to the next level and they need to look even more professional than they did before. So they're going to a professional web designer and they're paying top dollar for the features and, and designs that are put on the pages themselves. And sometimes they forget that that web designer is not going to rewrite the information that they have on their website for them. So then it's turned on them to find 
someone to do that. Unless, of course, they have a partnership already, which I tend to try and partner with web designers so that they can reach out to me when they have a client in need. But that's what they're looking for. They need a professional sound. They need it edited because even the silliest mistakes can really hurt your reputation. So it's important that it gets looked over. Yes, and present you in the right way and send the right message and basically brand your company appropriately. And as you mentioned, I think what happens with businesses is they think that when they hire somebody to design their website, that what you do is included or part of that. And it may be in some cases, but in others it isn't. And then they realize, oh my goodness, I don't have the talent or capability to put something like this together to represent my company the way I want. So this is where you come into play and they look for somebody like you to help them put all those pieces together and have the content that is on your website represent you in the best light. Right. And similar to their web designer, I'm going to have a at least a one hour consultation and talk to them about their brand and how they want to be portrayed on their website and see if they're achieving that with either what they already have or if it needs to be rewritten or just edited. So, I mean, it is possible for them if they have the time to put some stuff together and just have me edit as well. I don't have to necessarily rewrite, but in most cases when they're doing a serious expansion in the business, it turns into a full rewrite because what they had before no longer describes what it is they do. We all make changes to our businesses. We all pivot and and go in slightly different directions and we drop certain aspects of the business and add others. So those things can all be changed. Yes. Also, right now, people aren't really considering or they don't know enough about the marketing behind the material that they put on their website. There are considerations if you're trying to do organic marketing. You need to know a little something about keyword use, phrases versus words, and making sure that they are in the headings and somewhere in the content so that people who are looking for you and searching for you, that material will come up and then they can learn about you because they were searching for that specific phrase for those specific words. So that's something that I also build into the content and have in mind the entire time. And I think that uh, if people can't afford to go to, say, a digital marketing firm and have them do some big marketing campaign, the basics that you can start with is making sure that the content on your website and in your blogs is already search engine optimized. And that's very important. Because it'll definitely drive traffic when people are searching for a particular information that they need. And I just love the article that you put together. And I would love our listeners to be able to look at it so that they can get a sense of your writing style. Where would they find this article that you wrote about the favorite holiday traditions around the world? Uh, They can go to my website at scribesyndicate.com. They can also look for a posting on Facebook that the Scribe Syndicate page. So it would be facebook.com backslash Scribe Syndicate. And it's posted there as well. Wonderful, because I think they're going to really get a sense of your writing ability. It was just so beautifully put together. And I'm excited to discuss that today in the podcast and go over all the different traditions from the different countries that you highlighted. So let's start with the holiday traditions that take place in the Philippines. What's the main highlight that you can share about that? The fact that they do have the longest Christmas season starting in September, or like late September, early October, and that their traditional Christmas food is ham and cheese. <laughs> so, and, you know, in reading about that, I you see where these things come from. And a lot of traditions around the world do start with like, what were people able to afford to eat back when they were trying to celebrate? And so that's kind of where that came from. That used to be expensive items for people to have on their table. And so it's still part of the tradition and something that you must have. And I just think that's nice to see where it comes from. And the article will go into more detail about the specifics of the traditions that they have in the Philippines. But definitely the ham and cheese that you were mentioning is very popular. It's called queso de bola, which is basically a round cheese. And it it is a traditional gift that people like to share during the holidays. Gift giving in the Philippines is very big. Everybody likes to exchange gifts. And that is one of the things that they like to share. They love to do fruit baskets and different things throughout the holidays and it just goes on. So that's definitely one of the things that people have a tradition with. So now let's move on to England. What was the main highlight you learned from that? 
Well, since I kind of grew up with the English background, none of it was a, a real big surprise to me. But one of the things that my family doesn't do that's traditionally English is, is having a tea time. My mother does do mincemeat tarts. Most people, if they don't know what mincemeat is, it, it sounds terrible. It's actually sweet fruits that are chunked up and, and put into tarts and pies and things like that. So it's actually quite tasty, but it sounds kind of gross. <laughs> <laughs> and what I didn't realize, and it makes perfect sense to me when I think about it, is that uh, England doesn't have Thanksgiving. I mean, that was definitely a new world thing coming over to the United States and Canada. So that's not something that England celebrates. The fact that they call Santa Father Christmas is interesting. Other than Canada, I'm not sure who else actually calls him Father Christmas, but I think everyone's familiar with that though. Yeah, I think we've all heard the term, but I'm not sure where it came from. Right. And then they do Boxing Day, which when I was young, uh, growing up, whenever I was with my English or Canadian cousins and relatives, we would celebrate Boxing Day the day after Christmas where kids would get maybe another additional gift, but the adults wouldn't. It was really just a hang out with more relatives that had the day off. Oh, I've never heard of Boxing Day. That sounds pretty interesting. Yeah. So the other weird thing I found, though, near England was there's Wales is actually a separate country sort of between England and Ireland. And they go Christmas caroling with one person with a horse skeleton on their head and then a group of carolers around them. And it's a Celtic tradition of some kind. And it just sounds kind of kind of odd. But, you know, hey. <laughs> well, a lot of the holidays are odd when you think about it. If you try to make logic out of <laughs> stockings and all this other stuff, I mean, it's just all put right. together for whatever reason. You could probably trace it back to a certain time where somebody came up with the idea and then it just stuck and grew from there. And I think that's what holidays are. They're a mix of different traditions all put together and selected according to what people want to keep doing. And as you mentioned, different families take part in different things. So even though we celebrate the same holiday, we do it differently, which when you were talking about Thanksgiving, it was a really good point, actually, because the United States, typically, we don't start the Christmas season until after Thanksgiving. And I think that's why we don't have a very long Christmas season is because we wait until Thanksgiving is over. And then that's when it gets kicked into high gear, whereas other countries don't have that. So since we're in the United States, obviously, we know about how we celebrate holidays generally here. But did anything strike you differently when you were doing your research about holidays in the United United States? Well, just the fact that it varies a lot. Like you said, we all do a variation because we all hail from different countries and that's all come from parents and grandparents. We are in a very large country, so there's different areas where the climate is warmer or colder. So different activities throughout the U.S. are going to be, you know, like I had mentioned, the, the carriage and sleigh rides more in the northern areas of the country. But then you have people in Florida who, you know, I've been in Florida for Christmas and it doesn't have that same Christmas feel to me because there's no snow on the ground and but they're still putting up their trees and they're still having their Christmas meal and you know it's just different I think that's the big thing with the U.S. is climate and just this mixed pot of ethnic background yes you're absolutely right I think you hit it spot on and so did you find any major differences between Canada and the United States Oh, um, not too much other than, you know, they continued the Boxing Day tradition, which they got from England, and we kind of dropped it. Canada is also a really, really big country, so there's people coming from all different parts of the world there, too, but even a little bit different than the U.S. because they're so further north. You know, they have the Inuits or Eskimos that do uh, their own festival of dancing and gift exchange, and, uh, you know, I don't want to butcher the, the way they, they, what they call their festival. I think it's Sing Tuck. There is the tradition of mummering in the area of Newfoundland, that, that province up there. And then if you go towards Nova Scotia, they do bell snickling. And this is just door to door in costume, singing to people and you know, the guests get invited in for um, something to eat or something to drink. But then I'm from the western side of Canada where everyone's English speaking. There is the eastern side of Canada that everyone is primarily French speaking. So all of their stuff is based around traditions from France. And so like their Christmas Eve, they call a rebellion. They call Santa Père Noël, but they still leave, you know, gifts under the tree for the kids. They do have a meal that's uh, 
made of pig's feet <laughs> and then the meat pie that they make out of venison, pork, or beef. So going from west to east and north to south, you just see a lot of different things. Yeah, and it's interesting how the foods vary so much from culture to culture as well as part of the holiday tradition. And so now we're going to move on to countries that are not known necessarily for Christmas because they have different religious celebrations like China, Japan, or even India. What are some highlights there that you were able to identify, even though there are obviously Christians in all those countries? Did you identify anything specific that they do that other countries that celebrate Christmas do not? Yeah, I thought it was interesting that they've been heavily influenced by the rest of the world to acknowledge the holiday season, to acknowledge Christmas, even though that's not something that they do. So like in China, there are younger people, I think since about the 1970s, they've been influenced by the rest of the world and they now celebrate Christmas. You know, they'll go out to dinner, they'll put up a Christmas tree in, in some of their shopping centers. They even have a, you know, like a mailman maybe might even dress up as Santa as he's delivering mail that day. But there's a lot less Christians there. So they're not decorating their homes and they're not playing Christmas carols. They do have like an ice and snow festival. In Japan, they are influenced by Western culture through Kentucky Fried Chicken. The franchise became popular when people from Western areas like the Americans started to move into their country and they wanted to celebrate Christmas and there wasn't anything that even remotely resembled American food. So Kentucky Fried Chicken gets in there and that became the staple of people that were visiting. And then the younger people picked up on that. And now it's such a big tradition that they have to reserve their meals two months in advance from Kentucky Fried Chicken. Wow, (laughs) that is so interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think that even fast foods in general are embraced differently in different countries. Yeah, definitely. What about Spain? have a really interesting thing that they do. They have one particular area, a tradition, and I'm going to butcher this too, Tio de Nadal, which is a Christmas log, which has a face on it and a little red hat and leg. And they're supposed to be the stick on it and sing songs while waiting for the log to actually poop a gift. <laughs> so <laughs> kids go and wait in another room and supposedly pray to this Tio to deliver the presents, and that gives the parents a chance to go and hide the gifts, which, you know, they can find later. But even though that's the one thing that they do in that area of Spain, it sort of carries out in the rest of Spain in the El Pagana, Pagana, which is a doll that squats with his pants down. And so the legend was that farmers would be punished with a poor harvest if they didn't have one of these little El Paganos in their nativity scene. That carried through, and now the entire country has to have one of these little guys in their nativity scene and now they make them the where their traditional style and then they also make new versions with sport icons and rock stars and there's like as I was looking them up there was even one that was Obama yeah (laughs) (laughs) so so and that's kind of funny other than that their traditional food at Christmas time is more or less seafood and I'm sure that's because they're surrounded by water and that would make sense Yes, definitely. And again, it's regional, right? Nowadays, we can access pretty much anything we want, but traditionally, that is what has been utilized and therefore it reflects back into the holidays when they celebrate. Yeah, at the very end of the article was Australia. And that was fairly unique because I hadn't really looked at a warmer climate area. And Australia has the flip of our seasons. So Christmas comes when it's in the middle of summer. And so they're barbecuing on the beach, which it's just an interesting thing to even think about because, you know, we're used to it being the cold season. It's not for them. And yet they still have Boxing Day. They still have Christmas, Christmas Eve and have a dinner. And but Santa's using kangaroos instead of reindeer and he's wearing summer clothes. (laughs) Yes. And that just goes back to your point about weather. Weather does not stop the holidays. It's just celebrated differently. And I have a lot of family and friends who live in Australia, and I just get a kick out of their posts on Christmas because it's totally different, as you mentioned. (laughs) They're out there in the heat, (laughs) enjoying summer-like weather, and we're freezing. (laughs) And it's just so different from what you would expect, again, because we are so trained to think about Santa in the sleigh with the reindeer and all the different things that tie to winter. And so when you're celebrating in a country that in a different season, then, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to imagine. (laughs) 
Yeah, I didn't know you had some family out that way. That's interesting too. Oh yeah, lots of family and friends that live there. It's, it's totally different and wonderful at the same time. And I think what we're going to do is wrap it up with Mexico because what we can do is have the listeners go to your blog and read up on all the traditions with the other countries that you've listed because there's so many different ones like Germany, Austria, Hungary, Venezuela, Poland. What are some traditions over there that you found interesting that perhaps you didn't know about? I did not know about their Night of the Radishes, and this is on the 23rd of December, where they display figures of carved radishes, and I guess that was one of their main harvests, so the idea of putting an entire display together of carved radishes, and from what I understand, they're extremely intricate, I would love to be able to see that sometime. Me too, I've never heard of it. Yeah, really, really unique. They're a very Christian country, so they have one of the longer holiday seasons as well. I see some Spanish influence in there as well. Yeah, it's so interesting how cultural influences impact different ways countries celebrate the holidays. And again, it reflects in food, it reflects in tradition. And as you mentioned, we also gather hodgepodge of different traditions and put them all together. So you may have... 20 different types of traditions in one culture, but then one family celebrates five of them and the other one celebrates all of them. And so they pick and choose what they want to have in their families. And that's what makes it so unique because at the end of the day, there's a lot of commonality between the traditions, but also a little bit of um, family tradition that comes into play, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. So it does become unique to the family. Yes, it sure does. And I cannot wait for our listeners to be able to read the article that you put together because it was really brilliant and so insightful. And it's able to go into detail with the other countries that we weren't able to cover today. So would you remind us again what website they need to access to look at your blog? Yeah, they can go to scribesyndicate.com and they can also find us on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com backslash scribe syndicate. And then they can they can read the whole article there. I do start out the article by saying, you know, just look for the countries that you think your parents or grandparents came from and learn more about your family and talk to your parents and grandparents and find out the reasons why, because it's really enlightening. And fun. I think that even though we are familiar with our own countries, there's things I learned and I didn't know about. So <laughs> it's amazing how much we still don't know because we just celebrate generally how everybody else does. You know, we all know about the Christmas tree and the stockings and turkey on the table for dinner, depending on what part of the world you're from. I get so fascinated with the differences in holidays and I'm just so grateful to be able to talk to you about it today because this is exactly what the holiday spirit is about, that we're we're all different, yet we're all united, and we celebrate the joy of the holiday season. And so thank you so much, Jessica, for sharing this with us today. And I'm just really excited for them to take a look at your full article because it really just goes in depth into many other countries and celebrations throughout the world. Well, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. I really enjoyed this. I don't get a chance very often to do a podcast. And it's much appreciated. Oh, it's been my pleasure, Jessica. Thanks for being with us today. What's your favorite holiday tradition? Send us a tweet at LBO Podcast. Thanks for listening, and thanks to Jessica Oma for being my guest. If you find value in our show, please visit liveblissedout.com to reach out, subscribe, and share on social media. This show is made possible through listeners like you. Thank you. So long for now, and remember to keep moving forward.